We're going to get started because we only have an hour to be here and we're so excited about all the things we want to tell you about and thank you all for coming and spending your lunch time with us. We're, we're very, very pleased. Our goal for today is to introduce you to all the ways in which you can be involved in um, our interprofessional education initiatives here, um, both on the Portland campus and on the Biddeford campus as well. Um, and many of you know what we're doing, but we really want to fill you in on some new initiatives. And I think some of you are here to hear about our uh, interprofessional honors distinction. How many of you came specifically to hear about that? Oh, just a smile. The rest of you are here because we're just awesome and you want to be here. That's great. And, or that's my interpretation of it. So we can go, we can flow with that. Um, so. Let me get started because we have a number of people who want to chat besides me. Um, I, my job is to introduce you to our honors distinction. It is very new. Um, it is a pilot, which means that we ask your forgiveness ahead of time for things we're probably going to learn uh, along the way this year about how to run this um, honor certificate. But we feel that many students here at the university go above and beyond um, just attending events or just, you know, doing one IP class, um, that, that they really become committed to this concept of quality care that happens through team-based work. And so we want to honor you and have you be distinguished amongst others um, when you graduate. And so this honor st distinction will do just that. And my job today is to tell you a little bit about how you go about doing that and tell you what our process is thus far. So this cartoon just, um, the meaning of this cartoon is that um, there are no browning points for doing it by yourself. That an IP distinction um, is not something you can accomplish on your own even if you're the best student ever in the entire history of the university. We really want you to be the best student ever with other great students. Um, and so one of the things you need to think about before applying for the distinctions is who would be natural other professions to work collaboratively with? What kind of project can you do with someone from another program where you will learn about each other and with each other and um, that you will advance our knowledge um, and your knowledge about what interprofessional learning and collaborative practice is all about. Um, if you have an idea or a project and you really are shy or you just don't have an opportunity to interface with students from other programs, people in our office will help pair you. We will help bring you together and we will try to have some events this year that are a little bit more social so you get to know each other in a number of different venues. So that's the first thing you need to know about this distinction. The second thing I want to tell you is there's lots and lots of ways to do this. Um, first and foremost, we are asking you to participate in at least of three or more of our regular ongoing activities like today. Um, but other events that we put on just as part of the landscape of interprofessional education here at the university. You will be able to, in your portfolio, and I'll talk about the portfolio in a second, um, include all of those events that you attend. What students who are going to be part of the distinction will do extra than just attending and participating? And our goal is to make those events mostly interactive this year as much as we can, given the large number of students that we have, is that you will put into your portfolio a one-page reflection uh, or a short discussion uh, about what you witnessed, and then there are there will be specific competencies that we will ask you to write about. This set may sound at this moment really complex, um, but it's really very easy to do. Um, it's we're not we're not going to grade them for your grammar for your sentence structure. It's really a stream of consciousness to really talk very candidly and very genuinely about what you saw or didn't see. You know, what did that pre presenter present and what met that competency that you're looking at? Or maybe they didn't. Maybe you write a critique. Um, but we're asking you to do just a one-pager and put it in your portfolio. 
Along with these three events, or three plus events, because of course we hope you come to everything, because that's how we are. We're very excited about everything that we do here. Um, you will have an opportunity to do an IP distinction project. These are just a number of ways that, that we already have established that you can engage in a project. So, and we'll talk about those in a minute more in, in more depth. But you can see we have mini grant projects. Um, we have poster sessions. If you're interested in getting together and doing a project and having a poster session, either at our research and scholarship day, or we have actually had students have posters accepted to national conferences and we will work with you to get there. Um, we have, um, uh, Donna will be talking a min in a minute about the Bridges uh, project that she's working on, that's multicultural and diversity in uh, interprofessional leadership. Um, so you can see up here that we have a number already established projects that you can say, I'm gonna do that with another profession and this is what we're gonna do. We also are completely open to you coming to us and talking to your faculty folks and saying, I'd like to do something really different. I'd like to create a website, or I'd like to start a blog, or I'd like to start a project somewhere that hasn't been started before. If we have the support of your faculty um, leadership and we can help you get something new and exciting started, we will do that. So some of this is easy, seamless, and some of it is adventure and creativity. We would love you to feel comfortable with all of that. So if anyone has questions, just ask me as I go along, because those of you who know me know I will talk forever without stopping. But if please interrupt me. So here's how you do it, and as this is what we know so far. You find a learning partner, as I said, and, and it doesn't have to just be two of you. You can have four of you. You can have six of you. But find someone from another profession um, and from another program. Decide on what, what, what I'm kind of calling in my brain your extra mile project, so what you do above and beyond um, your learning events. Um, identify a faculty member, and that faculty member doesn't have to be in your program. One of the cool things about interprofessional education is that it's not specifically about your profession. It's about working collaboratively as a team. So you can find a faculty member that you've been dying to work with in another program and ask them to be your faculty member or mentor. What you do have to do is make sure that your academic advisor is cool with this because we want to make sure that everybody in your program knows what you're doing, that there are no surprises, and that you're in good academic standing to do something like this. You're not adding something on when you're already stressed out in your academic program. Does that make sense to all of you? Okay. Then we want you to create a folder, um, either a literal hard copy folder or a folder on your computer and as you begin um, acquiring these um, projects, stick it in that folder and keep it there. Um, we are in the process of developing an e-portfolio for you. And once we get that all set up, we will tell you how to upload into those e-portfolios. We haven't got it down yet. We've got the design of it made. But for the meantime, if you're anything like me, you have things in multiple different places, Go right to your computer and click on create a new folder, create it, call it IP distinction, and then you can start saving all your stuff on there. And as I talk about this, remember we are in Hersey 326, 327. You have any questions, you have any concerns, come visit us and we will answer anything you have to ask. So that's the distinction. Let's pause here for a moment. Any questions? Okay, we have on your table this here, which explains to you exactly what I just said, pretty much. So you have it, you can hold it, you can use it. Um, if you are interested, uh, come to our website, ipec at une.edu, and we will send you what we're sort of calling your pre-application application, which will say to us, hi, my name is Susie Jones, I'm in PT. 
I really have interest in working with someone from pharmacy, uh, so I have intention to apply for the um, portfolio, the distinction portfolio. We don't expect you to come up with your portfolio, your extra mile project today or tomorrow or even in the next month because you're just here, you're just learning about what you want to do. But when you do come up with it, there is a second thing that you, this is your actual application. And again, it will, you will get this electronically via our website. And you and your colleagues, whoever is doing the project, will fill this out and this will come to us and you should put it into your, in your folder, okay? So any questions you have about this, you can go to your faculty mentor, your faculty advisor, or to Chris or I or anyone in our IPEC offices. We're trying to make this as streamlined as possible, but again, we're just learning. We're very excited about this. And so are your faculty, and so are the deans, right? Okay. Oh, yay. Yay for tweeting. Everybody tweet. Okay, you had to get her going, Gail. She will be tweeting now. All right, since Trisha Mason couldn't be here today, Trisha Mason is our Director of Service Learning, and she just wanted me to impart to you some of the projects that you can get involved with. And let me just say that service learning is one of those extra mile projects. Um, and so you might, those of you who want to get out in the field and apply what you're learning about and with each other to actual work in the field, here are some of our projects. I can't, can I turn this? Yep, awesome, okay. So um, Donna will be talking in a minute about the Bridges to Multicultural Collaboration, so I won't talk about that. Um, we have um, the Riverton Park Yoga and Zumba um, opportunities, and you can learn more about that through the Channels Project and through other folks, through Tricia. Um, we have Cumberland County Jail collaboration, which um, Dr. Carrie Dunn from Social Work is the organizer of, and I don't know how many students we have going through the jail, but we will have someone talking about that um, with you a little later on in the program. Um, we have uh, Hardy Girls, um, which is a project for young girls and women to gain um, confidence and to uh, combat um, various stereotypes of girls and women in our culture. We have a number of health fairs that you'll be learning about um, that are with some of our elder populations that take place in our dental hygiene clinic. Um, which you, if you haven't seen our dental hygiene clinic, you really should go there because it is fabulous. It was just redone. There's amazing work that goes on over there. If any of you are interested in global interprofessional education and practice, um, Dr. Jennifer Morton from um, our nursing program uh, runs something called our Ghana Global Health Immersion. And that's actually two, almost two weeks in Ghana um, participating in a community clinic. And I have been there. Um, I was there a couple of years ago, and the experience is life-changing. So if you have interest in working with your colleagues in a, a cultural immersion project, and this is true immersion, this isn't staying in a hotel and visiting places, this is living in the community, with the community, working with community health workers who are part of the community, and doing excellent, excellent, sustainable health work. So if you have interest, again, Tricia Mason can talk to you about that. And these are just some of what we have going. Um, again, if you have some interest in other programs, let us know. So I'm happy to pass the baton to Donna Gasper Jarvis and to talk about Bridges. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks to Shelley and Chris for inviting me to be here uh, this afternoon and talk to you a little bit about this new initiative. Um, I know some of you in the audience um, already who've probably heard me talk about this at least once, maybe twice, so bear with me and forgive me um, as I introduce some other students to this, uh, to this new program. Um, so as Shelley said, uh, my name is Donna Gaspar Jarvis. I'm the director of the Office of Multicultural Affairs and Diversity, and I've partnered with Tricia Mason, who's our director of service learning um, for this new program called called um, Bridges to Multicultural Collaboration. Um, and I do have some postcards here as well that will go into detail what's on the slides. Um, and I'll leave them at the back that'll give you some more information. 
Um, but in short, um, this is a program that is designed to raise students' cultural awareness, um, sensitivity, cultural humility, and learning and working with um, diverse populations in the community. Um, so we've partnered very closely with community partners who will be learning with and from, um, and there are several components to it. Um, we've tried to make this as, um, as accessible and flexible and easy, knowing how busy um, uh, uh, Portland campus um, graduate and professional healthcare students are. Um, so there's three, um, three different components and then sort of a reflection piece. The first is an orientation that really looks at um, yourself, so a self-awareness piece looking at your own uh, multiple identities, possible bias assumptions about a particular community, um, and then sort of a macro overview um, from a community partner about the um, community being explored. Um, the second component is what we're calling the bridge, which is a community awareness workshop, and we've collaborated with the IPEC team so that it's one of those Wednesday new time events. And we'll again be bringing in people from the community to um, do a panel presentation about some of the unique issues, um, strengths and challenges from that um, population, and then have students sort of sit at round tables and discussion around a case study. Um, the third component after you've done the self-awareness and community awareness piece is to actually go out into the community through a service learning project, which will really look different depending upon what the community is, what the theme is. Um, so for this fall, for example, we're doing two different tracks or two different themes. Um, one is partnering and learning more about the immigrant refugee community, specifically here in the Portland area. And the other um, track or theme, um, completely separate, is looking at poverty and homelessness. Um, so some of those service learning components would be working with, um, so for example, for the immigrant, re immigrant and refugee, we've partnered with the Boys and Girls Club and are going to be doing a big um, basketball clinic and healthcare fair at um, one of the Portland um, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs and inviting all the other clubs to come. So working with kids and, um, and also their parents in the community. Um, we're working with um, Riverton School, which has a very high percentage of um, new immigrant refugees at that school system. Um, so during their parent-teacher conferences, students would go in and, um, and work with the students doing different sort of health care promotion activities and events, um, and, and many others. We probably have about five or six different options that students could sign up for. And the same for the homeless and, um, and poverty track as well. And then the fourth component is a reflection. Um, we ask people to write, um, participants to write just a very short reaction, so we, mo mostly that we use for feedback um, in terms of what was been successful or how we might want to adapt it, and then offer students an optional opportunity to um, do some peer sharing and learning at an IPEC event in December. So very concise, very short, um, and hopefully um, tied in with some events that you may already be coming to do. Um, some of the other themes that we're looking to explore um, in the spring, we'll probably do an immigrant and refugee population track again, because this initiative is also um, being tied in with this channels grant that Shelley referred to, which, among other things, it's a large HRSA um, grant written um, by uh, Dr. Jennifer Morton in the nursing department, which is um, aimed to improve the um, health um, outcomes and experiences for the immigrant and refugee population. So we'll probably do another track in the spring um, and possibly an LGBTQ track as well. I was just talking with Dr. Krebs about how we might partner with some of um, the work that he's going to be doing um, around LGBTQ initiatives in the spring as well. Um, and you can see all the other um, list of different possibility or themes that we might do um, either this year or certainly next year. Uh, so our first orientation is actually this evening, um, starts at 5 o'clock here in Lugkey. We will have dinner, if that's incentive for anybody, and, um, and there will be the um, immigrant and refugee community track. So again, we'll be doing sort of some introductory activities, icebreakers, at where you look at your own um, identities, multiple identities, intersectionality, and um, touch on bias and assumptions. And then we have um, Toho Soma from the city of Portland coming in and doing sort of a macro overview of the local immigrant um, refugee community 
Um, and then next Wednesday will be the, um, the IPEC event where we'll, we'll be having all the community health outreach workers that we work um, in partnership with with the city of Portland, who are the cultural brokers and navigators um, doing a, a program where you would be able to actually sit at a table with one of these chows, that, without community health outreach workers, um, to talk about what they're experiencing in the community as, as cultural brokers and navigators, and also have a chance to do a little bit of interpretation work um, and, and what that would look like if you ever need to work with a, a language interpreter as a healthcare professional. Um, the Homeless and Poverty Orientation is next Thursday, um, September 25th, again here in um, Lugkey, dinner served. And um, it'll be similar in format in terms of the bias and assumption macro view, but we'll be partnering obviously with um, the Oxford Street Shelter, the Milestone Project um, to do that orientation. And then that bridge event will be the following Wednesday, October 8th, um, with a panel discussion on poverty and homelessness and the chance to do some case study work. So that's sort of a brief overview. Does anybody have any questions about the Bridges to Multicultural Collaboration? It is part of this honors distinction. It's also a standalone. Um, we're trying to sort of take students on a journey. Um, this was actually brought to us by a student in the pharmacy program that um, had seen what we're doing. Um, we're doing something similar on the Bitterver campus and had said, can we do something like that on the Portland campus? Um, for healthcare students, and so we sort of took our ideas and ran with it um, and tried to make it really easy and accessible. Um, but I hope you'll take part. Please uh, feel free to come tonight or next Wednesday's orientation, and again, I'll leave, some, uh, I'll leave some of these postcards at the back if you want the dates on this. So, thanks. Me again, sorry. Um, so I was wondering, since Lacey and Nora are here from IPSAT, um, I don't want to take over anything with you. Do you want to come up and talk about what you're doing this year for Clarion, or do you just want to correct me as I move along? They would like to correct me. I knew that was going to happen. So um, this year, uh, some of you have heard of the Clarion event. Um, we've mentioned it, and it is one of the areas for um, gaining honors distinction. We are not actually going to participate in the national Clarion event this year. Those of you who are here, though, um, ongoing, uh, this year what we'll be doing is um, getting people ready. I think the terminology I've heard is kind of a Clarion prep. Um, Becca, do you want to add it? Do you want to say anything? No, everyone wants me to do this. So um, thank you. Um, and really, the Clarion is a lot of work, and it's a lot of thought, and it's a lot of time. And I think Ipset was smart to say, let's get people prepared ahead of time. And then when we get the case study, which is part of the Clarion, we will be ready to roll with it. Those of you who are graduating this year or going on to your clinical rotations and you won't be on this campus a lot, you can still get credit um, in the distinction for participating in this event because what it does is it prepares you for thinking about larger systems implications to your health practice. And what I wanted to do is give you um, an example of the kind of case material you would be working with. Um, the University of Minnesota um, sends out a common case example that asks students to come together in teams and determine root cause analysis of a given health issue in a community and come up with recommendations um, to help remediate and improve the quality of care for people suffering with this health condition. And um, the teams then uh, go through a, a team presentation to our local health experts and we have people from um, Quality Counts, from Maine Medical, from other um, Maine Health, from other programs who are the judges. Um, and students present their outcomes. Um, and then for the clearing itself, the winners of that um, uh, competition go on to the University of Minnesota. So this just gives you um, a little synopsis of the case we did two years ago. Um, and I should add that doing this really gives you experience working in a team. And I'll say from those I know Lacey participated in before, it's not easy. You know, you really have to learn the skills for teamwork. It's not natural to everybody. And so this was the case, um, and this is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid consider heart disease to be ambulatory sensitive condition. As a social worker, I had no idea what that meant. 
Um, and so it was helpful to uh, find out what it meant. And um, so it's, uh, what it means is that uh, if you do a good job in your outpatient setting, um, you can reduce the number of people who come to the emergency department in crisis and those who are frequent visitors to their health care provider for problems that could be resolved if there's some upfront proactive health education, health promotion, um, community resources developed, that we need to be thinking about this. So in this case, uh, there was a fictitious West Plan Health Center uh, that is interested in having you as experts come and help, um, help with this process of what can we do for patients identified at risk for heart disease? What can we do in our community? What do we need to do in our environment? What can we do in our system? And how can we overall do a better job that meets the um, uh, stipulations of the triple aim um, and, and also improves the quality of caring for our patients in our community. So that's the kind of case you would be working on. Every case is different, has a different health issue. Um, you, you do not have to come in with clinical expertise. So a first year student can do this. Um, you just need to come in with a brain that's excited to learn about something uh, from your own vantage point and from the vantage point of other people. And um, so the IPSAC group will be talking about this uh, prep more, and their meeting is next Tuesday, uh, September 30th. Actually, that's not, that the next general meeting is two Tuesdays from now, um, 5.30 Wing Lounge, which is over there. Um, and you're all welcome to come. This is a general meeting. It's not an executive meeting. And this was the last team we had uh, that went to um, the University of Minnesota. And um, you can see it's an incredible group of people and uh, had a fabulous experience. So I'm now going to um, invite Chris, because Mike DePeace isn't here yet. Um, you want to talk about the Maine Cancer Foundation? OK. Thank you for being so patient with all this information. So we appreciate it. It is a powerful charge of information. Um, on your table, if you haven't already signed, put your name on the contact sheet, which is on your table, um, you may have done it at some other event. But if you haven't done it, um, please do put your name down, and we will um, share information with you that way. But. Anytime you have a question, just email ipac at une.edu. I check it obsessively, <laughs> and I will respond very quickly to your questions or inquiries. So if any of this is at all fuzzy once you leave, I'd be happy to try and uh, clear things up. I think um, I really want Mike DePice to talk to you about the Maine Cancer Foundation opportunity. It's another opportunity to participate in a team project that would make you eligible for the IP honors distinction. Uh, so just hold that for the moment. OK, I'm back in business. Um, so Mike is was driving here at noon, so he'll be here shortly, and we'll just go back to him when he comes in. So mini grants. So our office has a little pot of money that we can give out to interprofessional projects. So it gives you a chance as leaders to choose your own interprofessional team and work together on a project that's of interest to you. So our goal with the mini grants is to create collaboration-ready health professionals uh, through giving you modest funding. Uh, it's a comprehensive grant-making process, so there's a sort of amazing application you have to go through. But if you're going to apply for grants later, which you all will because you're going to be leaders in your field, um, my grant is not unlike the, the big real grants that are out there in the world. You'll craft your own interprofessional team, and you've been meeting people from across professions um, all semester while you've been here, so consider them all potential members of your team. Uh, we encourage you to use service learning. Um, the event, the uh, projects that Shelley just listed to you, a lot of them are also mini-grant uh, material as well as IP distinction material. 
um, we do encourage the use of the arts. And I have a couple of students who are going to come up and talk about the mini grants they did. And one of them was a very exciting use of the arts. Um, we ask you to have a faculty person work with you and be your mentor and help you through, especially if you're doing something that is um, research-based and you need to go through the IRB, you'll need help with the fac for a fac from a faculty person for that. And then we like to have you present your work afterwards because in the professional arc, if you get a grant, you do the work, and then the next thing you want to do is publish or you want to go to a national conference, and we want to see you through that arc here in school so that once, once you're out, it'll be a natural progression for you. And so I would like to introduce Colin Bader, who was part of an interprofessional team who put together a mini grant about photo voice. Uh, hi, everyone. As uh, Chris said, my name is Colin Bader, and I am a Master of Public Health student here at UNE. Um, I did a mini grant project with a good friend of mine named Lily Bottino, who at the time was a social work student. Um, she's now a graduate. So it was a photo voice project, which um, involves providing a group of people with cameras, which they use to take pictures of their life and environment. Um, it's usually, it's often used with groups of people whose perspectives and priorities may be underrepresented or unrecognized. Um, the resulting pictures are used to shed light on their circumstances and raise awareness in the community and among policymakers about the conditions they face. Um, so the purpose of the project is to empower the participants and allow them to express themselves through the photos, um, recognizing that they are the experts of their own environment. Um, for our specific project, we worked with a small group of Somali women in Riverton Park, which is a housing uh, complex here in Portland, and it's largely made up of immigrants and refugee individuals. Um, all right, so yeah, we worked with a small group of women and we gave them cameras. Um, we, hoping to help them give voice to health and social issues that they may face in their community. Um, so right now I'm going to do a short activity that involves audience participation. Um, here is one of the photos that the woman, um, one of the women took, and I'm just wondering if sort of you have any initial thoughts um, or ideas about what the picture meant to her, what she was trying to say, why she took it. So if anyone has any ideas, just feel free to blurt them out. Um, she just mentioned that it's hard to see what's through the fence. You can't really tell what's beyond it. Any other ideas? Yep. So, um, yes. So he just mentioned that it's segregated. Um, so yeah, that's we've done this before, and that's what we hear a lot that the fence can represent, you know, barriers, obstacles, restricted access. But for this participant, it meant something different. So here's the caption that goes along with it. Um, and as you can see, she said she took this picture of the fence because if a fence was built like this and it was in between the road and the playground, it would be safer for the children to play. So in their community, there's a playground located very, very close to the road. Children are sometimes running out into the road after like a ball, for example. And she really, to her, it meant protection, safety, and security. All right, so we'll do one more photo. Any ideas? It looks like it was taken either at night or around dusk, evening time, I think. All right, well, so when we first saw this photo, we actually thought it had sort of an odd sort of beauty to it. We thought it was kind of a nice, sort of a nice photo of maybe like, a, it almost looks like it could be a flower or some, you know, vegetation there. Um, and here is the caption that was actually sort of what the woman described when she showed us the photo. It's a picture of her backyard. 
Um, it's dirty and unhealthy and needs to be cleaned. So um, she explained to us that her backyard often gets trash and debris in it. There's some other pictures that she took that was, are along the same theme, and that it wasn't her that had created the, the trash, it was other community members. Um, she specifically mentioned some local teenagers who would leave their cigarette butts and broken bottles just around her yard, so. And so the purpose of that activity was to demonstrate how photo voice can be used to challenge any sort of pre-existing assumptions or expectations that people might have looking at the photos or going into the project. Um, as you saw from the photos, some of the issues that emerged through them taking the pictures were around the themes of community safety, littering, and another theme that emerged was around limited access to exercise opportunities. They were talking about long main winters and not really feeling like they had a, a place to um, exercise. Um, so this is a picture of our team. I'm on the far end. Lily is my, uh, the social work student. She's the other one in blue. We also um, collaborated with two other key members. Um, the red scarf is Kira Moss, who's a social worker from the Portland Community Health Center. She works in the health center right there in the Riverton community. And so she already had some community ties and was able to help us connect with our participants. Um, and then the last on the far left is Sara Shriek Isaac, and she served as our interpreter and cultural broker. Um, so she's a well-known member of the Somali community in Portland, and she helped make the participants feel more comfortable. She helped translate some of our materials that we use with them and their descriptions of the photos um, and ensure that we had mutual understanding with the participants. Um, at the end of the project, we had 27 photos that the participants chose they felt that rep best represented their experience. We held an exhibit in their community, and lots of community members came, and their kids and their families, um, to sort of just celebrate the project and appreciate their photos. Um, and for us, it really re uh, resulted in some really nice conversations that we had with the participants. Um, it was obvious that sort of the process helped them better sort of, they were more able to articulate um, some of their concerns and speak with us about them through the process of taking the photos. And it also helped us to draw some attention to the, um, the women's experiences in the community. The forecaster did an article on the project. We've done a few other presentations and we did the exhibit of the photos both here and on campus. Um, both here on campus and at, the, um, at their community in Riverton. Um, and it looks like real results are gonna come of this. As Shelley mentioned earlier, um, there's gonna be another interprofessional student-led project to bring a yoga class and a Zumba class to the community. And so that'll help address some of the concerns they were speaking with us about regarding um, limited access to exercise opportunities. Um, so that's just a brief summary of the project and thank you for your time. thing I love about this project is that it's a really just a few simply constructed moves, right? It wasn't all that complicated. We handed out the cameras, we asked questions, we were curious about their lives, and uh, this project did go to a national conference in uh, Texas where there was an entire conference about art and health care, and um, they were very excited about what this represented. I think I'm going to switch the order up a little bit and ask Brian to come up and talk about the many grant projects that he's been involved in at the Cumberland County Jail. Hi, uh, I'm Brian. I'm in the Accelerated Nursing Program. Um, and last year I joined the Cumberland County Jail Project. Um, it started about three years ago as a Biggest Loser st style competition where they uh, put pods against pods within the jail, and it was solely based on exercise. Uh, over the years, it developed into more of a weekly Wellness Wednesday, where they taught them about general health concerns and ways to be healthy in jail. Um, and th at the end of last year, we targeted, uh, with the help of the inmates, certain topics that they really wanted to learn about. So I, in collaboration with another nursing student, a social work student, and an occupational therapist, over the summer developed a curriculum through this grant project. Uh, so that way, throughout the upcoming years, all students will have 
uh, set in stone things to do rather than going into the jail without any sort of direction. Um, so we targeted uh, wellness, exercise, and stress management. And these also include things such as hygiene, uh, getting into a proper sleep cycle, uh, nutrition. And we would go once a week or so, talk with the inmates, get information from them, and then come back, debrief, talk about what was important, what was not important. And uh, we developed an application process and a required interprofessional aspect to each team's. Uh, so now it started for the fall. Um, there's three teams, each diverse, have at least three or four different professions within each one uh, with an associated faculty member. And they will now go into the jail with our curriculum so that way they have some direction. And um, I guess. So this is actually a dated photo. This is from last year, but Carrie Dunn on the bottom right is through social work. She is the faculty member that led the whole project. Uh, Becca was also involved and a few others. But um, on the top left is the OT member who was with us last year. So it's already started for the fall, but it's starting up again in the spring. And this is one of the IPE events that you can do for this, uh, this honors program. So keep your ear out for in the spring. Uh, there is an application process, like I said, but it's fairly straightforward, and it also goes through Trisha Mason, who's the head of the service learning opportunities. Um, and I think that's all. Do you want me to, do you want to talk about it? Do you want to, if anybody has any questions? Oh, do you have any you or questions? Questions for your junior year? Thank you. They're around, and I know how to get hold of them, so if you email me at ipec at une.edu, I'll connect you. So um, it's 10 minutes of one, right? How many people have to leave at one? OK. So a lot can happen in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to introduce Mike DePice, videographer, who's going to talk to you about the Maine Cancer Foundation uh, grant and the projects that um, are come out of that, as soon as I back through Colin's presentation. And we might show you a little snippet of the video that they've put together about cancer pain. And we have Holly Haywood here who is the campus photographer, and she needs to take a photo um, at 1 o'clock or shortly thereafter. Uh, Nora has uh, kindly agreed to be our lead subject in the photo, and we need 15 to 20 folks sort of arrayed behind her. All of you are very attractive, and I think you would look great in this photo. So if you don't have to leave at 1, if you could stay for maybe another 10 minutes and be part of this photo opportunity, Holly will be very grateful forever and ever. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to Mike, and he's going to talk to you about, now this is not a mini-grant project at the moment, but it could be. Hello, everyone. I'm going to make it quick so you guys can get out of here by 1. But... Um we have basically been uh, <clears throat> working with the Maine Cancer Foundation. We had uh, received a grant from them last year. And uh, the video component, I'm a videographer in the research office. So my job in particular has been to reach out to various folks that suffer from different types of cancer. Uh, there's three completed videos right now. And uh, there's a young girl that's 13 years old. There's a middle-aged man and an older woman around her 50s that um, have all experienced different types of cancer treatment. and. Uh, the point is it's pretty painful, a lot of what they go through. And uh, we're trying to raise awareness on that and try to change a little bit about what goes on with their care. So being able to you know, relate to these people and get to know them was awesome. And uh, they shared some of their stories and they were just great throughout the process. So we're going to run a video. Say what we're looking for? What's that? <laughs> so there are four videos total. Um, what we want are some student leaders who are interested in oncology 
interested in the intersection of cancer pain and uh, interprofessional teamwork and what they're hoping, the final product for the grant is to create case studies that other people can use to show the video, look at the facilitator notes, look at the case write up and have a robust interprofessional conversation about how this person's pain could have been managed better or how it was managed perfectly well or some variation thereof. So I'm looking to fund teams to get together and watch these videos and produce the materials that will allow them to go out into the world and be used in that way. I work at the Cancer Community Center. I'm the manager of volunteer services. I've worked here for six years. I was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia in September of 2010, and I had a stem cell transplant in December of that year. It was quite a shock. It really came out of the blue. It wasn't like I knew I was sick and I knew I had something big. I had a couple of crazy little infections through blood tests that I got. Because of one of them, I was, had my diagnosis. I know a lot of people with cancer. I've helped a lot of people with cancer. It's not like a foreign world to me like it is to a lot of people. She said I'd have to go into the hospital for three weeks to get chemo, to get rid of the leukemia so then I could prepare for a stem cell transplant. I was there actually for seven weeks um, because I had to have another round of chemo. It didn't kill all the leukemia cells. You know, I could never really feel the disease. The only thing I could feel was the side effects of the treatment. When I went to get a stem cell transplant, I had high dose chemo and radiation and I was very sick from it and I got these mouth sores. My lips were all like black from blood and I had sores all in my mouth and down my throat and they basically went all through me. Understand that when we administer chemotherapy, you know, the intent is to kill cells. Uh, the, the theory behind it is that uh, the cells that are most rapidly dividing uh, will take up the chemotherapy and, and therefore most likely be uh, destroyed. For instance, in the gastrointestinal tract, where the average cell, I think, turns over every two or three days, you commonly will see um, adverse reactions from chemo and or radiation therapy. I got an abdominal infection called C. diff, and that was very painful. My guts were just always hurting. It was horrible. In addition to all the the sores, I got something called host versus graft, which was my new immune system fighting against my body. Lisa, my wife, and my sister were very supportive. They were very scared. They felt all the fear that I didn't feel. My sister was my stem cell donor, so she was very active, a part of this whole thing. Cancer is growth gone awry. It's basically cells that are growing too much, too fast, and they're kind of eating up other things and taking over other things. I didn't have cancer after the second round of chemo here in Maine. I'm so glad that we have the medication that we do, and I feel kind of like, oh, I never thought I'd be on so many as I am now, but I am, and it's saving my life, so. Say thanks to Mike for that great video. The thing I like about that I work video at the is that it shows us Center. I'm the level of quality that we're really looking for in the output, that's a really nicely done video. And so are there, is there anybody here from the Oncology Club? I see an Oncology Club person. So there is a club on campus that uh, looks to deal specifically with cancer pain, and I imagine some of our leaders will come from that club, but there, I'm sorry, what's your name? Are you okay if I out you as a member of the Oncology Club? <laughs> Sarah, a PT student. 
so now you all know who she is. Uh, the club meets pretty regularly, and it's got quite a robust interprofessional uh, presence. Um, so if you have questions about that, you can talk to Sarah. Uh, if you have questions about making a mini grant around this cancer pain project, IPEC at une.edu. Get straight to my brain, and I'm happy to get back to you about any of it. Anybody got any questions? I know that it was a ton of stuff, and I wish that it was easier, but that's how it goes. <laughs> questions about the IP honors distinction? Mini grants? Have you been in the wrong presentation this whole time and just realized it? <laughs> Shelly, you want to wrap us up? With a big bow. So thank you all for coming. Um, you may have some ideas already. Uh, you may want to talk with each other a little bit. We have faculty who are here. Um, we'll out the faculty, raise your hands, who are more than happy to be mentors to your projects. We are so excited for you and with you. And um, thank you, Mike, for driving up from Biddeford. Um, and come see us and uh, be in touch with us. And we'll stay a little while for one-on-one uh, -on -one questions, if you'd like. So thank you. <laughs>